Hey, Deserving Listeners. Today I'm going to interview Victoria Shepard, who is a documentary maker and writer in the UK. And I'm going to talk with her about her new book, which is about delusions, which I thought would be an interesting interview. So let's go to that. Hello, I'm Victoria Shepard, um, and I'm the author of A History of Delusions, subtitled The Glass King, A Substitute Husband and a Walking Corpse. The Glass King, a substitute husband, and a walking corpse. So why Sorry. did you name, why did you have the, the subtitle that? So it's a social history. I've put together 10 individuals from, from over 600 years. It's the very first delusion case that grabbed me was The Glass King. I was a radio documentary maker. I was actually doing something completely different, researching something completely different. And I came across this case which just has obsessed me ever since. It was the starting point for the whole thing. Charles VI of Scotland, at the end um, of the 14th century, who believed, came to believe, he was, he was dealing with the, with the Hundred Years' War, so he was, in a, he was in a, having a bad time with his wars with England. But the real problem that he was facing was that he thought he had turned into glass, literally turned into glass, which was a relatively new material at the time. There'd been glass before, but plate glass, which was now into pe- coming into people's homes and people were kind of, it was in the domestic space, was, was relatively new. And he would, the do- you know, various chroniclers of his life talk about how he walked around wrapped in duvets and blankets to stop himself smashing. And I sort of leapt out of this, this very, very, very esoteric academic paper that I was looking at con- con- connected to something completely different. And I thought, what? what? King of France thought it was made of glass, and it became known, turned out other people sort of caught it, metaphorically speaking, and he wasn't the only one to relate to this new material and to kind of melt themselves into it and to believe that they turned into, into glass. Um, and so I sort of followed, I followed that track and I made a program just about this case, um, and that's where it all started. It, it was, it's such an intriguing and kind of poetic, mysterious idea, and it just bugged me. Um, and so that was the door for me. And I think maybe to anybody that reads the book, it will be the same because there's a sort of fairy tale aspect to it. Very strange. It's obviously light. And also the jeopardy is very high, which is something that's true of all delusions. It's life and death. It's, it seems absurd. It seems completely ridiculous that there's this king who should be concentrating on his troops and he's, he's panicking about hard surfaces. And it's, it's funny. But actually, you know, it's, they're deeply serious. These people, this is life and death to people who are experiencing them. And so that, that's what set for me the essential question that the book tries to answer, explore. Given that you're, you're pushing yourself in this kind of, you're making yourself an object of ridicule, you're standing out from the crowd, you're doing all these things that we're mostly programmed to try desperately not to do with our lives. Why? What protection or what do they? What do delusions offer us psychologically that makes it worth being a laughing stock, being singled out, being incarcerated in asylum for you know for many people? And that's such a such an intriguing question. Um, and so then all the other cases that I then fell upon and started to find, I, I knew that they all, I wanted them all, and they all do, I think, start with a kind of thriller. It's almost like a like an, an Edgar Allan Poe mystery or a they're intriguing to that extent and they all are and they're all doing something very important for the people who are presenting with them and so that's that was the project so that's so anyway that so going back to the title the glass king you know it conjures images of, from fairy stories and things that were all glass slippers and it, it's a sort of image that we can we're all intrigued by i think most i certainly am and, and so i think it is a useful organizing image for the for the whole book and what it's trying to what it's trying to explore yeah interesting lots of questions <laughs> just going into the glass king a little bit so it's hard to diagnose into history because we don't have they didn't have the same language we're just going off of historical records and of course documentation of a king is going to be filtered through bias and storytelling but uh, you're telling me that centuries ago there was a king who had a delusion that believed He was made out of glass. And from my field as, uh, you know, a clinician in psychology, I am fascinated with how cultures will express mental illness differently and that uh, delusions often do have a cultural element. Some cultural elements seem to be present in a lot of cultures, like the idea of a god or devil or something. So often uh, through the centuries, there are delusions of 
I am God or I am a devil or the devil is inside of me or something like this. Mm -hmm. But to be glass, okay. it's interesting that, because um, of course today delusions oft sometimes involve Wi-Fi or uh, cell phones or the CIA or aliens, things that were not known in culture 400 years ago. But uh, centuries ago, since glass was this new thing, it's interesting to think, because of course in yeah. today's <laughs> world, gl glass is just ubiquitous. It's not something interesting, but of course back then it would have been this new technology. And if mm -hmm. you were prone to a delusion, you would have been prone to focusing on glass as a part of that delusion. That's that's really fascinating. Yeah, yeah. and exactly that. And there is a thread that runs, you know, these, these characters do start talking to each other and, and reaction to the new, whether that's um, a new material. I mean, there were cases of, of people in, Vic in Victorian England who thought their stomachs had turned to concrete when concrete became a new material. You know, there are literally just explicit examples where, as you say, people with a predisposition will kind of peg them, you know, will identify with a certain material and use it to kind of to express something. But what's interesting about glass is, although, of course, glass isn't new anymore, it's still incredibly um, useful to us. So, you know, in talking about the king, okay, we're talking about the 14th century, but it's actually, it's a brilliant distance regulator because it tells people, and this is still true, if you're made of glass, if you're trying to, find, if you're trying to understand what a, what a delusion is, is asking of us, it's very, they're performative, aren't they? They're asking, they're trying to tell you how to treat them, somebody with a delusion. And somebody who thinks they're made of, tells you that they're made of glass is saying, hey, back off, don't get too close. But also, also, I'm precious, I'm breakable, I'm a treasure, I'm, I'm extraordinary. You know, in Charles, Charles's day, there was a kind of sense of our chemical kind of religious, you know, make, burn, um, heating sand until it becomes transparent must have seemed pretty uh, miraculous. And there was a kind of religious dimension to it. But even without that, you know, this kind of boundaryless communication that we're all living with now, it seems to me it's still it's a perfect um, metaphor for or kind of um, expression of social anxiety. It would still work, and it, you know when when um, so I made some documentaries about about delusions, and we had a few people, including a producer, interestingly, a very urbane producer who said, "You know, I, I thought my leg was was glass for a, for a few months." So it's still about, and, and um, I don't know if you've ever kind of come across something such a sort of somatic a glass delusion yourself, but. Uh, Andy Lemain, a professor of, um, well, he's, he's a psychiatrist, but he, he was retired and he's working in Leiden in the Netherlands. And he'd met somebody in the early 90s who'd come to him saying that they were made of glass. So again, you know, maybe 30 years ago, but it's a long time after it was a rare material. Andy Lemain's interpretation of it, which I think really sort of stands out, was certainly interesting, was that once he'd uh, he talked to this young man, um, sort of tried to just tried to explore what he meant by I'm made of glass and that he wasn't a patient he was just somebody who come to see him but he's pointed at the window and said um when you see that glass that that's me because I'm not there and I'm not there and, just, and there was this idea about he kind of turn himself off he kind of negate him disappear somehow it was a useful way of him wanting to disappear and one Andy Levine talked to him a bit more about um what had happened to him He'd, ha he'd experienced a really, really traumatic, terrible car accident. And um, as a result, in the aftermath, his parents had been, the whole family had been really overbearing. Again, you know, his interpretation was that there was a claustrophobia, family claustrophobia, that, that the glass delusion is, again, it's a distance regulator. It's trying to get everybody to just back off a bit. And so anyway, that's a, that's a, a case centuries after the, the kind of melancholic um, scholars, you know, me scholars melancholy glass delusions of, of the early modern period, but it's it's functioning um, in a very similar way, and it's still a useful tool. It seems to it seems to be people still seem to crop up, and you know, it hasn't really gone away. There was this sort of epidemic um, in inverted commas early modern Europe and a sort of hysteria about it. People, plays and poems written about characters who thought they turned to glass. Cervantes, you know, wrote short stories about it, and it crops up all over the place. Um, but it never went away. And once I'd done a bit more research, you know, I found some Scottish archives. Because that's the thing, of course, often women weren't recorded. So then people start talking about the scholars' melancholy, which was attached to in the in the fifteenth and sixteenth century, was very much a male thing. But mainly because I don't, I, I, I 
you know, pretty sure it's because they just didn't ask any women. They just weren't talking to them in the same way or having the same kind of conversations. And in um, a Victor- 1880s archive of of, um, of a Scottish um, uh, psychiatrist, countless women, and it's just noted down as part of their kind of admittance interviews or of their basic sort of, you know, when they're um, interviewed during their, their time in the asylums in, in Edinburgh. And lots of glass limbs, lots of glass heads, glass feet. Hmm. So it seems to be men and women as well. Yeah. yeah. So I think you were maybe getting at this, that <laughs> we today, uh, we have people who suffer from clinical delusions, uh, whether it's schizophrenia, some sort of psychosis, but we all are suffering, or many of us are suffering in, from various different uh, anxieties and worries and sadnesses and grief, and that we might all be susceptible to delusional expression of those emotions. Did you write about that aspect? Yeah, I did. And actually, that's what I'm most, well, it's what, it's what, what enriched my life, having written it. Um, so I was absolutely trying not to take what would have always or traditionally been looked at as a a kind of marvel of the mind, set of curios and slightly bizarre stories and look at the social history, look at like what the, what the actual real lives and what might be going on in there uh, along, alongside that. So I've sort of done that and you can find traumas and reversals of fortune and it very quickly becomes apparent that that it's a self-protection mechanism. It's not an escape from reality. It's a way of dealing with reality, having a delusion. And then once you realize that, you feel a connection with your own troubles um, and your own strategies. And then, of course, I mean, what was really interesting, because it is a very, relatively new field of study, because obviously the history of madness, quote unquote, has a great deal of um, scholarship in it. But delusions is a very sort of discrete topic, have, have been sort of overlooked. And, you know, to, definitions are very important, aren't they? So they're kind of, I'm looking at it very much as a fixed false idea, a, sing, a single fixed false idea that uh, you sustain, you, you keep believing, in, despite lots and lots of evidence to the contrary. And when you look at it like that, and in fact, um, studies in the 90s, the first time I ever asked the general public about delusional thinking, they just never asked before. And when they did, they found, of course, that we're all, we're all somewhere on that scale. We all have at least one or two things about ourselves that if we asked our friends and our loved ones, they'd say, that's, that's, that's not true. Right. Well, one of us. <laughs> so what kind of trends are you seeing lately around that? The ones that the, the delusions, paranoia is the delusion that so I hear from speaking to clinicians. Obviously, I'm, I'm coming at it as a historian, but for speaking to, to clinicians, it's, it's, um, it's paranoia that's, that presents itself. Um, mm-hmm. Why do you think that, why, why do they say that is? You know, there's various ways into that, isn't it? It's a very, <laughs> it couldn't be more timely in that sense. I mean, I, you know, there's a, there's a kind of explanation that starts with the 60s and, and um, Russian, the Great Seal, which was the, the discovery of, of a bugging device for the first time in, in an American embassy. And people just for the first time realizing, so this, you know, um, paranoia has been the most common delusion for a long time, for most of the 20th and uh, early 20th century, 21st century. So there's a kind of, again, technology explanation for it. But then there's another way into it, which is which touches on other delusions too, which is to do with how hard it is for humans to deal with complexity, ambiguity, ambivalence, cognitive dissonance, as it's known, you know, holding conflicting ideas in your head that make your cortexes fight with each other. Mm-hmm. Just most of us can't really stand it, and we'd rather have a theory, a, a, a story, a clear story. Yeah, uh, QAnon, for example. I don't know if you QAnon, right. went into anything, that like, sort of thing. Well, yeah, like anything rather than anything rather than confusion. And James Tilly Matthews, the second chapter in the book, is he's an amazing character. <laughs> I mean, the reality of his story is so much kind of crazier than his delusion. He was a um, he was a he was a um, a tea broker in the 1790s. Um, autodidact taught himself all sorts of things. He came from rural um, Staffordshire, um, selling tea in the city of London, and then got involved in the French Revolution, got himself a kind of uh, ticket on a boat out to Paris in the 1790s and got in a complete mess for obvious reasons. 
the French thought he was a spy, the English thought he was a spy, he was in trouble on both sides and had, you know, bounty on his head, whatever he did, and was kind of chucked back across the channel into poverty in South London. Um, and he's the kind of first case um, of paranoid schizophrenia, the first kind of case study of paranoid schizophrenia. He was studied by, at the Bethlehem Hospital, known as Bedlam in London, which was a sort of notorious mental hospital um, in London. And the, uh, the man who was running the, the clinical, that's maybe, a, you know, running, running the institution, wrote a whole book about him. Um, and so that's how we have this incredible story of this. But anyway, he developed a paranoid delusion that it, it's, I mean, it's mind blowing. It's um, and, and the uh, the he, he was an incredible um, draftsman and graphic artist. Um, and he he conceived of this idea. He called it the heirloom, and it was a contraption, kind of Heath Robinson contraption, that would use magnetic forces that was using magnetic forces to change to kind of manipulate politicians in Westminster in London and it was being operated by a kind of Dickensian proto-Dickensian gang um, who were literally pulling levers and uh, and changing the making basically they were there to to um, bring the French Revolution to England and overthrow the British government um, and he was influenced by ideas of um, Mesmer Franz Mesmer and all the new physics that was being discovered everything magnetism the age of, of great discoveries about unseen forces and it's like we are in now you know a very very interesting case study to look at in terms of looking at our own psychology today because the, the echoes are there you know without diagnosing anybody because obviously I'm not a psychologist but as a historian the echoes are there about how um you know him, him sort of trying to assimilate what, what he knew was controlling things that he knew were controlling him, but he couldn't see. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, he's a great story for, for today, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to think about it that way. And of course, it, it makes total sense, but I, I hadn't really considered it before talking with you that, for example, when the vaccine came out for COVID-19, there were all these ideas that there was a chip inside placed by Bill Gates to infect humans and to watch us. And of course... Uh, it's ridiculous on a number of levels, technologically, motivation-wise, blah, blah, blah. But the expression of the, if you think about the anxiety of it, what is that an expression of collectively? It's probably, I don't know, fear of vaccines. It's like, I, I don't know what's in that thing. What's it going to do to me? Okay. Fear of technology. Uh, I don't know what technology is. I don't know what it's doing. Is it doing something to me? Is it going to hurt me somehow? Fear of Bill Gates and I guess what he represents to a lot of people uh, in a lot of strange ways, I suppose, that he represents like the Internet or computers or mm -hmm. runaway technology. And, uh, of course, we would all have rational fears about all those things. But instead, and then you try to talk about it, there's no place to talk about it, or you feel like you're not being heard, or you're not being taken seriously, or you don't even know how to express it because you don't even know where to begin because you don't understand how vaccines work, you don't understand how technology works, you don't understand how industry works, politics work, and you're just like, there must be a computer chip inside of the vaccine, and it, it, it laser focuses your anxieties and your concerns into a very concrete, understandable idea. And then, of course, that spreads through the culture and everyone latches onto it and starts to cherry pick date, cherry pick data to confirm it. And then mm. you have a runaway mass delusion. Yeah, N no, exactly. And, um, you know, it's ironic because that's why they're so useful um, in, in other delusion cases. They organize your enemy, don't they? like a phobia or, I mean, I don't, I, well, I haven't found what my delusion is. I'm probably sure I have as many as the next person, but I was a, was a bit salutary when I realized that phobias have a lot in common with it too, you know, because it sort of organizes, it gives you a job to do. As long as you stay away from lifts or birds or whatever it is, um, you know, or as long as you stay away from hard surfaces, if you're delusional in that way, or as long as, so they, they can, they're really, really brilliant. Uh, mm -hmm. s a survival strategies for us to, to simplify our enemy, which can feel like a very nebulous 
complex, contradictory thing. But of course, then the danger of we're all, we all want a simple narrative, but what if it isn't simple? What if it is a mess? But right. we have to just we have to accommodate, assimilate yeah. something that's messy, and we call, we don't want to do it. And it makes me uh, think systemically about society and about how to change things. Because of course, you want vaccine compliance. You want uh, people to follow certain ideas. Of course, you don't want people uh, taking up arms and shooting people based on these delusions. And it, it makes me think about how we deal with these kinds of delusions. As a society, we just ridicule them, right? We just laugh at them like, oh, look at these idiots. But... We don't try to pay attention to, okay, well, what are the emotions that you're talking about, Victoria, that are driving these delusions? If we can soothe those those emotions or address those, the, the delusion will potentially be mitigated, right? Absolutely. And that's a kind of a whole section of the book, of each of the characters' stories in, in my book. You know, is should they be, the question underlying it, should they be cured? And if so, how? Because obviously there's an argument that leave it alone. Most of them are protective for mo most of us. It's protective and they're pretty sensitive. They're useful to us. But the ones that are dangerous, that uh, you know, and even not looking at kind of paranoid conspiracy theories of today, but before, you know, the idea of the ruse, you know, that's, that's as old as the hills, the idea that you kind of try, how, how might you trick somebody? Would you, can you meet them with a, if, with the Christ, for instance, there was a case you know, there was a theory that if you had, uh, if you've got all the people who thought that they were Christ, had a delusion that they were Christ and put them in a room together, that they would kind of realize that it can't all be because there's three of them. Didn't work out. It was a, a, a man called Milton um, Rokich. I don't know if you know him. He, he wrote a book about, yeah, the, the three Christs of Ypsilanti um, in his Michigan experiment that went horribly wrong because it, it didn't work. They just sort of beat each other up. <laughs> had a massive brawl. I, I, I can't remember the exact thought process from these three uh, people suffering from psychosis, but if I remember right, they basically just looked at the other person and said, like, well, you're crazy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? he's crazy. Like, yeah, yeah, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I'm Jesus. Those yeah. two people thinking that they're Jesus, obviously they're crazy. Yeah. Right. Or, or yeah. you know, the, there's, a, there's a case in my book of a, of a, um, a woman in this case, but this was a man who, who thought he was dead. So there's a phenomenon of people think, thinking they're already dead, going to the doctor saying, sorry, I, I'm already dead. And, and a, med a, a kind of Renaissance period doctor put, an, put a dead body, in inverted commas, um, in a box next to this man and then made it sit up. You know, this idea that you could say well if you're dead and he's dead and he's just sat up then you can't be dead. you kind of snap people out of it but actually sorry going back to what you what you asked me um what seems to work across centuries across european i mean it's very much these are very much european stories but it's just meeting people it's very simple as you say just literally um the idea that it's very kind of i've come away feeling so compassionate towards all the characters in the book because actually all they want is to be worthy of interpretation and attention, really. It's incredibly simple. And once, and most of the doctors in one way or another did kind of realize that, that if they just pulled up a chair and kind of met them halfway, they might not say, yeah, you're made of glass, but they, it, they might say, they might play along 50%. And that allowed the person, delusional person, to kind of meet them 50%. And things that they were clinging on to for their very survival they could they could let go of and they could kind of evaporate and that seems true of all of the eras and all of the characters that i include in the book hmm, interesting it's, it's you know just attention yeah that's a complicated thing while i absolutely agree that there are accounts and i and i've worked with people like this that so god where do i start um mm. for some people as you're saying they seem to have a delusion that is malleable meaning that with attunement, with safety, with some cognitive help, with some support, the delusion either goes away quite a bit or completely completely goes away, and their delusions are more of a manifestation of, as you're talking about, emotional distress and wanting to be understood. You know, they're expressing some kind of fear through a delusion. They feel unsafe, they feel fragile, and they aren't being heard or they feel like there's no way to be heard or something. And so they, 
they come up with this extreme metaphor, if you will, of how they're feeling on the inside, which is, you know, they're made of glass and, and they're hoping that people will. And it also gives them something to do. It's like, I'm going to focus on my physical fragility, which feels easier or more attainable than focusing on my emotional fr fragility, mm -hmm. which seems impossible to address. Certainly there are people like that. Um, the Another category of people I've treated psychotic people. It's not a specialty of mine, but in my 25 years, I've you know s treated some. Mm -hmm. Their delusions are completely something of a disease. Essentially, they suffer from psychotic bipolar, uh, psychotic uh, schizophrenia, and you could argue it's an expression of some sort of emotional process. But it's so elaborate and so um, ingrained and so extreme that we don't usually conceptualize it as an expression of an emotional it, it's it's more of a dysfunction of the brain in the way that if you have a brain injury or something mm -hmm. and you develop some kind of deficit you wouldn't say that's an expression of emotions you just say like well so, something's going wrong with the neurons and medication mm -hmm. is the only answer and, and and so when we talk about delusions we're we're kind of lumping all that in now having said that there are people who suffer from schizophrenia and psychosis who want to be understood, you know, part of their symptoms is exacerbated by people not listening to them. You know, mm -hmm. if you believe that aliens are inside of you and no one is listening to you, it's very distressing and the distress can actually increase your symptoms. And so mm -hmm. if you as a clinician actually just sit down and pay attention, which isn't very frequent, right? Then the person can be like, oh, finally, someone is just understanding how this feels for you. I mean, just imagine feeling like aliens are inside of you. That's an incredibly terrifying a difficult thing and this person actually believes me one and two is soothing me and my physiology starts to relax and my symptoms go down not always because you know I've treated people who are psychotic who I did everything I could and everybody did everything they could but you know mm -hmm. given their mania or whatever it, it just it just went off the rails and there was nothing anyone could do emotionally around this person to stop it so that's another category of people who suffer from what we might call you know, clinical psychosis who benefit by being understood and heard. It's not going to take it away. And mm -hmm. so that leads me to the last thing I'll say, because <laughs> this is kind of a complicated issue, is that there are reports of what I'll say charismatic clinicians who mm -hmm. are known for being geniuses, if you will, and will claim that they can cure any psychosis with their particular technique. And those ideas have been largely debunked <laughs> because they're anecdotal, they don't really stand up to research, and they're just trying to sell a book or they're narcissistic mm -hmm. or something's going on. I just want to add all of that out there to the conversation. We're, we're using the word delusion to, to cover a, a lot of ground. I yeah, guess. and... and that's really important. Definitions are all and and the overlap. Of, you know, I'm talking. I am. Sort of, I have taken the liberty in a way of taking a psychodynamic lens onto a past before there was such a thing, uh, before the vocabulary of it was, you know, even conceived. Um, and obviously, minds aren't neat, and people can be very unwell, psychotic, and so on. I mean, that's the the the, the story that. I don't know, I find my, I, for my journey in sort of unpicking this a bit was most interesting was it's, it became known as the delusion of doubles because the, the French coined a lot of these delusions um, after the revolution. They, there was, they just were working in this field and they were the first really to try to categorize and really speak to people who were presenting with delusions. Um, and there's a lot of, lot of unhappy French um, uh, you know, housewives as well um, in the 20s, because this kind of carried on for a for hundred odd years um, into th this lady. She was known in the case study as Madame M. And she went into, like the others, many of the other cases, it starts a bit like a, like a thriller. She went into a police station asking for a divorce on the grounds that her husband had been uh, murdered and swapped for a, for a double. Mm. Um, good, good, good opening premise. Um, and so the kind of doppelganger, then it turned out had children had also been uh, spot for doubles. And there was this kind of horrible Frankenstein thing going on. People were being, their bodies were being sort of snatched and swapped. And 
very macabre, um, like real hammer horror level story. And this is all going on just after the First World War. And it turns out her children had died in infancy. She'd experienced this awful, awful loss of several children. And obviously the First World War, lots of, most of the young men had died too. Um, so there's a lot of psych point I'm trying to kind of reach for is that there's absolutely compelling psychodynamic explanations for these. You know, there's very good reason why it's easier to believe your husband is a double than that you don't like him very much, which is probably the truth. Um, or that the unbearable fact of the loss of your children, easier to believe that they've been put in the catacombs under Paris, not that they've just died of typhoid. Um, and, you know, Freud writing about the uncanny and it feels like the sort of splitting idea that you, yeah, that you would create a double rather than deal with the real person. But then it's the one delusion that we now absolutely categorically relates to um, a particular um, neurological pattern. I believe it's called dementia with Lewy bodies. You can spot it like Alzheimer's. And it, it interrupts the recognition self and other parts of your right brain. And um, they can see where it is in the brain and people who, you know, so that was quite, um, it confronting, you know, I found that quite difficult because like you could see that both sides could be true and that you can't, you can't answer these cases that you can't know, but that it's the most interesting one that I came across where both these, both of these kind of ways of looking at it and, and she may well have had, Madame M may well have had a right brain inflammation um, or an ovarian tumour. There's a lot, do you know about this new research? I don't know if you come across that. No, I mean, not about the ovarian tumor. I, I've heard about the section of the brain that matches one's emotional valence with the visual data. And if uh -huh. there are, and I'm not a brain scientist, so I, I'm butchering it, but if there's a, an injury there or some kind of pathway problem, you can look at so a loved one or someone that you know really well, mm. but it doesn't feel like it's them. You see that yeah, they yeah. look like them, but they don't yeah. feel like it's them. And then it's common to conclude that it must be an imposter. And right. because that's the only way that the, all, you know, this would make sense. Um, right. And so uh, there's a number of cases like that. You know. Yeah, and I, I heard, you know, the left brain sort of steps in with the, with the, with the story, the right brain, as you say, from, knows it's familiar, but it's but doesn't recognise the recognition part's disrupted. The, the ovarian tumour stuff is really. I spoke to a neuro neurologist who was talking about, and this is really new stuff where there's a brain cell in the ovary and in the and in the um, in the right part, right uh, frontal lobe, which is very similar, and it's a kind of autoimmune response can in the in a, with the cancer of the ovary can can go and get the brain cell because it thinks it's the same one and cause inflammation in the right side of the brain, which seems to correlate with a lot of particular kinds of delusions. But um, it doesn't mean that the psychodynamic story isn't true too, or that mm -hmm. it, it couldn't be both, or, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the people that I look at, you know, we didn't have scanners, we didn't have MRIs, so, it's, so it, will, it will remain a mystery, mm -hmm. and I just have to be okay with that, but it's... Yeah, well, it still <laughs> is a mystery. We we have scanners that can look at things with pretty low resolution, but in the future, I'm sure they will laugh at our current size. So you talked about the glass king. You talked about mm. the substitute husband. Mm -hmm. What about the walking corpse? What, what was well, that? I touched on the on the walking. So I've talked about the substitute. Yeah. So the walking corpse is this. The, the case is Madame X, who I mean, she experienced her delusion starting, which isn't uncommon actually, like a lightning bolt down her back. Hmm. This is in the 1880s um, and believed that she's died. So it's kind of absolute denial of food, self. Just says, you know, she, when she's interviewed this, her, um, her doctor, who who's, ends up in a Proust novel, actually, as well. I mean, all the, all the doctors in these French asylums are in the 1800s and, and se late 1700s are just as interesting and just as delusional as, as their patients might and just as traumatised by the same wars. Mm. Most of the doctors had served in the First World War, or, and you know, so they were all read, they were all kind of connected, doing this dance in terms of talking to each other about their ostensibly their their studying these cases, but actually, um, the other right. anyway. So the so Madame, Madame X um, believes that she's dead, and uh, there's many cases 
you know, that crop up again over way before this and way after that. But she's a particularly interesting case because I was able, it's just late enough, I'm able to kind of do some research and find out where she'd come from, you know. And what actually with so many of these cases, it's been moving and really intriguing to find a lot of them at these moments. They're still, they're still just one piece of a jigsaw, but you'll find something. So with Madame X's case, I found out she mentions in her interviews with Dr. Cotard, she says, um, something had gone wrong in her first communion. She'd been rejected by her family. And you don't know any more than that, hmm. but it's obviously something catastrophic. I do a bit of research into what it meant to mess up your first communion hmm. in, in that point in history in France and ter- terribly traumatic thing to do. It's, your, it's one of the most important moments in your life. We don't know whether she spilt the wine or what, well, we don't know. That God would reject you, you'd go to hell or something yeah. along those or maybe lines. She, or you, if you didn't confess fully before you had your first communion. Or there were mul- many way, apt, incredibly strict protocol about what you had to have done. You had to fast beforehand. And that you'd go to hell and that you would yeah. live your you know, eternity in, in utter pain and suffering. And mortal sin. And this had obviously set this, this, you know, this was at the core of something how it's interconnected but there's always a moment or several of them with each of these people that you could find and the you know a moment of trauma um so you know that's true of there's another character who you know she Leia Anna Bay who's a kind of very 20th century um delusion story where she she erotomania which was she she became the kind of poster girl for erotomania she was the case study for erotomania which was in again another 1920s case study um which is where you believe that somebody of high status is is in love with you so it's sort of like stalking but with the with a lack of responsibility for it because you're not you're not the one they're the one in love with you you're not you're not you're not pursuing them um, so you're kind of defended from being rejected, and you're also not responsible for your actions. It's a, it's an intriguing one. Um, anyway, she yeah. So um, oh, sorry, I've not lost my train of thought there. But she um, that's a, that's a particularly kind of 20th century kind of delusion. It's very much of its era in terms of technology. Again, to go back to the technology point, it's the the golden age of cinema. It's right. The fet- you know the idea of true love. And yeah, so and she's yeah. another French housewife, you know. Right. Not only uh, the idea of true love, but also the idea of a famous person is is relatively new. So she believes King King Charles the um, King George V is in love with her and travels from Paris to to London to stand outside Buckingham Palace and 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 watch to see whether he'll leave her a message, give her a message from twitching the curtains and so on. And like like paranoia, it's a very it's not it's a very dangerous potentially kind of delusion. Yeah. So none of these should ever be taken. I'm very aware that um, they have to be taken very seriously. So in closing, Victoria, um, for you, I I hear, I guess, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that the investigation of these cases and writing this book was kind of personal. Is that true? It got under my skin, as I said at the beginning. The gloss, I I knew there was something in it that hadn't been well trodden. Um, And I thought, it, and I still, you know, I think the enterprise of kind of putting a, looking at such a sweep Looking at psychology as a social historian, it's obviously a different, I'm not a clinician like you, and um, I'm fascinated by your perspective, trying to look at it, asking the right people, but just frantically as I could to try and find out what the reality of their lives were like, Mm -hmm. because that's what I do, and see if I can understand these people. I mean, it's very simple in a way, but that's become really personal to me, partly because I was writing it during lockdown, so they were literally my company. But it did start to get quite uncanny, you know. I did start to feel that I was sort of in a tiny, tiny way listening to them when they hadn't been listened to as much, you know. And that was a very powerful sensation. Now, how much I, you know, like I say, I've just, I can't confess my own delusions, but I will have them. So maybe that's the next stage of my journey is to sort of... um, well, you kind of alluded to it. You, you had an illusion that you could actually communicate with these people, that you were actually in connection with them, even though they've, they're have they long gone, right? Right, and actually the kid, right, yeah. Because that was emotionally important to you for some reason, right? Yes, that, it is. That, that. Yes, it is, it is, it is. And there's a lot in common with sort of ghost stories. There's a lot of, there's an overlap with fiction and with mystery, with all of these, because people are, 
they're, they're taking you on guided tours of, the, of an alternative reality that they've made for themselves. Mm-hmm. And so it is, a bit, you know, they're telling you stories and you kind of, it's like you've got to crack their code. That's part of what I've just found so personally exciting about it is that mm-hmm. is they're like encoded hopes and possibilities. Thanks, Victoria. Your book is A History of Delusions, The Glass King, A Substitute Husband, and A Walking Corpse, available now, or wait, releasing in July, so it's not available yet. In, in the U.S. in July, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.